Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for August the 21st, 2020. This is episode number 20. Today, we'll be talking about Candy debuts two low-cost cars, Lucid tops Tesla in charging and acceleration, the 2021 Porsche Taycan gets a performance boost. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, multiple EV owner and Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from the Out of Spec Motoring and One Lap YouTube channels. He also puts together the super awesome videos for the new Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. So welcome, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience especially those ladies and gentlemen of the audience whose status is single and whose Friday night is set to be spent conversing with their cat about existential dread and the horrifying prospects of aging alone. <laughs> and that's because we bring you potentially good news, at least if you're Tesla owners. There's an app on the way that might hold the answer to, your, to ending your lonely weekend spent anticipating the start of the work week. It's called Tesla Dating, and like it sounds, it is for Tesla owners wanting to date other Tesla owners. Now, it's not up on any app stores yet, so don't cancel your weekend plans of grooming your cat or dog. Uh, you can, though, leave your email address at tesladating.co, and they'll send you an email to get you on the app once it's ready to go. And as I say, you cannot spell love without EV. So now I, I, we don't think we need to talk about this a lot. In fact, I feel like I've already said too much, but uh, Kyle, you're a Tesla owner. If you are single, which you aren't, uh, would you be interested in dating another Tesla owner? Is that actually even a type? Uh, uh, no, probably not. I mean, I think uh, I all I really want out of this is a recording of the first date over dinner. I mean, I just want to know, you know, what software version are you on? It just it, oh, it oh just sounds like the most dreadful thing ever. I mean, we have gone too far with this. And, uh, you know, the thing is, it's just going to be a whole bunch of guys for the one girl that's on there. And it's going to just be awful. I, I think it's a funny idea. It certainly has made me laugh over the last couple of days telling some friends about this. And of course, we've had some laughs as well. And, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, think we all joined by now, though, right? So we're all matching. I matched with Tom. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just you'll, you'll go and meet some cool people and, and maybe you'll find eternal love with a Tesla owner. But honestly, I, I don't think I would want that. So what do you think? What do you guys think, Tom? Would you, would you ever do this? Well, what happens if you choose a restaurant for your first date that has a, tes a Tesla destination charger and you arrive first? Are you oh. supposed to walk in or are you supposed to be the gentleman <laughs> and leave oh. the spot open for the lady to come and plug her Tesla in? It's too confusing for me. I don't think I would go for this. I'm not smart enough to figure out the, the, the proper way to handle that type of situation. That's some new, new dating etiquette popping up. All right. Yeah, and we'll I'm just move, move, we'll just move right along there. Okay. Well, so the the big news of the week actually is um the debut of not one but two low cost cars from Candy or Candy Technologies, I think they used to be called. Uh, the K twenty seven is a four seater that strongly resembles, by which I mean it's it's in a, pretty much a copy of the Daihatsu Cast. Uh, it's a front wheel drive and has a top speed of 63 miles an hour. It, it has a 17.69 kilowatt hour battery that is uh, optimistically said to give a range of about 100 miles. It has a peak output of 20 kilowatts, which translates to about 26.82 horsepower. And it comes with a price tag of $17,499. Uh, from what I understand, it was originally sold. That's the, if you're watching this on YouTube, that's the one with the round headlights there on, I think your left. Um, so from what I understand, it was originally sold in China by a company called Ling Mao as the box, but it was purchased by Candy in a partnership with Shanghai Maple, which is a Geely brand, which is the same company that makes or owns Volvo, among other things. So, okay. So then there's the more, also the more capable K23, and that is a four-seater also, and it has front-wheel drive and a top speed of 70 miles an hour. 
It boasts a uh, sizable 41.4 kilowatt hour battery and is said to get 188 miles of range. It puts out uh, 49 kilowatts or about 65.71 horsepower. That's about like the old Beatles I think used to put out. Um, its price tag reads $27,499. Now, those prices are before the federal tax rebate. So they would be respectively $9,999 and $19,999 with that uh, tax rebate included, uh, plus any local incentives. So they are finding buyers, apparently. Uh, the company is reporting 463 pre-orders. So Tom, are any of these cars calling your name? <laughs> Definitely not calling my name. Uh, you know, the, 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 for the, you know, I mean, as a fun car like Kyle has that smart electric drive that he drives off road and 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 just beats the crap out of it. And uh, for something like that, I, I assume, but I don't really have the need for a car like that. You know, the the sixty three, the the K twenty seven, and by the way, the 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 nomenclature is a little strange on this. Usually, as the numbers right. get higher, that's like the better trim. It's the opposite with the candy. The better car has the lower number. The K23 is the larger car with the bigger battery and the more range. The K27 is the smaller one that has, you know, as you mentioned, um, <laughs> 20 kilowatt max output. I, I, I can <laughs> I, I can probably run faster than that. And, and the, the, zero, the, the, the top speed is 63 miles an hour. So you probably can't take that thing out on the highway almost anywhere. Um, no. And it, and it be safe. So it's kind of like a neighborhood electric vehicle. It's, it, you know, and I think there's better choices out there for something like that. Um, as you said, the range, you know, they're saying a uh, hundred miles with a 17.69 kilowatt hour battery, the smart electric drive had basically the same size battery, the 17 uh, kilowatt hour battery. So, you know, I think we could use that as a, as a goalpost for proximate range. This might go a little further because um, it, it's so weak and and, okay. and underpowered that you know that that will help it go a little bit a little bit further. Um, the K twenty three is a little bit more interesting to me. That might that might work for some people, uh, and it's it's inexpensive, but it's not like dirt cheap. It's still no. you know thirty thousand dollars before incentives. Uh, I'd be much more inclined to recommend like a base leaf to somebody. Uh, than than this, um, you know. Honestly, uh, uh, you know. Let's see. You know, the more the merrier. I, I certainly am not saying we shouldn't uh, give this company a try, uh, but uh, uh, you know, even the warranty. It's only got a sixty-two thousand mile warranty for the batteries. You know, that's yeah. th that that that's pretty short. So that's telling me they don't have a lot of confidence. In, in the battery pack. So, uh, you know, buyer beware as far as I'm concerned. Kyle, what do you think about this thing? Would you buy this? The Either exact of opposite of Tom. I love really? it. I would buy the little, little baby one with the circular headlights. I think it's so cool. And I just want to play bumper cars with them. Can we talk about this presentation <laughs> for a second though? because this was the most dreadful vehicle launch presentation. I mean, it makes Cadillac look like they knew exactly that what they were talking about with this <clears throat> lyric. It was really bad. I thought they did a very poor job. The people there were unprofessional. They didn't know anything about the cars. They used kilowatt instead of kilowatt hour. And I really think they did the cars a total disservice on the launch. Um, and also this whole like Americans driving the car, like totally fake saying they love it, like the right. Chevy commercials, like that right. was just silly. Uh, I, I thought it was so weird. They brought on a auto journalist from the gentleman racer. I forget yeah. the guy's name, but seems like he knows what he's doing. And they just on on the stream itself. were like trying to pry him into saying nice things about the car. And he, I, I think stood his ground pretty well and was like, look, yeah, basically what he was saying is it's kind of a pile of crap, but it's kind of cool because of the price you kind right. of just, you can justify it with the price. Right. Um, Personally, I would be super interested in the K27, which is the base little cheap one, just to like drive around the track and and use it like how I use my regular smart car and maybe take it into town. Um, and I, I already have a friend who ordered one. So, I mean, like, I think people are going to look at the price and say for 10 grand, I can commute to work. And as a pure, 
you know, cost savings. If you buy this car and commute for the next five years, it probably will pay for itself in fuel savings over a Suburban or something like this. So right. I see the benefit. I also don't know why someone wouldn't go and buy a used Leaf, a used i3, a used Smart Electric, something like this as a more premium product that's going to be highway capable. Um, but think about what these things will cost in just a couple of years. They'll be a 1500 bucks, two grand. We're going to play a whole soccer tournament with like 30 of them with a giant soccer ball. It's going to be amazing. Kyle, you are the outlier. You know that, right? Always. <laughs> uh, uh, and you made one comment that you'd like to use a K27 like you use your smart car. I've been down to your track. I've off-roaded with you with your smart car. And I will go on record to say if you did that with the K27, it would not last long. And, yeah. and, and you know, maybe I should know a little bit more about how it's built but, but what I do know is how Mercedes built the smart car. Those things are tanks. They're like yeah. one of the best built cars on the road. I think most people don't realize that, but I think Mercedes over-engineered it because it was so small. They wanted to make people safe in the cars. You, they're almost indestructible. I doubt the K27 is built like that. And I would venture to say if you did half the things with the K27 that you do with your smart that you it would just constantly be broken you'd be breaking suspension parts and and control arms and and and, and all that stuff i i should have I, we should have videos pumping now of you uh driving your smart off road but you know i mean well, you know I, I think that's a good test i think it's fun to say that and everything but in reality um you know i i, I don't i, I just you know, it's hard for me to understand why somebody would would, would buy this as opposed to buying uh, a used leaf for ten grand. Right. Yeah. Like dollars for dollar. I mean, the tax credit is the only way this makes sense if you really need it. And then whatever the resale market on the car is, like uh, people were buying up Konas a year ago, taking the tax credit and selling them for sticker. Like that was pretty cool. Um, you know, they were just doing, they were having fun with the car for a little while. My dad got two of them and did that. I don't think the used market's going to be there for this car. So you're probably better off, like Tom said, getting a better car for a lower total cost of ownership in a used, better quality EV. But there's still something about this kind of weird Chinese electric car that's, you know, just so silly and weird looking that I do love. I really do love it because it's so bad. Uh, you know, it's like Elon Musk's song that he put together. I can't remember what it was. It was so bad that it, you kind of have to listen to it. So, <laughs> don't doubt your vibe, man. Don't doubt your vibe. Yeah, it's kind of like that. <laughs> How about the Volt Dance? Do you remember the the, the Chevy oh, Volt geez. Dance back in 2010? That was so bad you had to watch it. But, yeah. you know, one last thing, not to continue to drag this thing on, but you we're talking about it's such a, it, it may it might make sense because of the incentives and because of the tax credit and I, I know I've said this in previous um, episodes but it's it's something that's really important to me and and I, I think it needs to just be constantly um, stated that we need to rewrite the federal tax credit it it yeah. really bothers me that uh, you know, foreign companies can come in and sell their cars in the U.S. and get the seventy the seventy five hundred dollars federal tax credit. When companies like Tesla and GM, you know, American companies that were kind of pioneering electric vehicles, um, they, they they went out there and did them early, and they 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 brought electric vehicles to the market and helped drive this whole electrification process. And now their their tax credits have expired, so they're at a competitive disadvantage over all these new car companies that are bringing their cars here. That thing needs to be rewritten. The federal tax credit, the, the, the limits per manufacturer has to go away. There's got to be one big pool or sunset it at a certain year, 2023, 2024, and then that's it and it drops for everybody. But we need to reinstate that for the American car companies because this is being subsidized by American taxpayers. So it's a shame that the, the two biggest American car companies that are making electric vehicles don't get the tax credit anymore when, when everybody else does, especially now we've got cars from China coming, uh, companies from China importing their cars to the U.S. and American taxpayers subsidizing their products when I can't get a uh, tax credit on an American-made car. So now I stood on my soapbox for a little while. 
we can move on. No, but I agree. It makes so much sense. Yeah. But uh, yeah, talking about the car just for a second. So the, the K27, like the one that Kyle likes, it looks like the Daihatsu. You know, I, I, I get your point. I like the way it looks, but man, I, I just feel like it's like unsafe. Like I wouldn't want to be in an, an even like in a low speed accident with it because I, I just don't well, know. Well, it doesn't go very fast. <laughs> yeah, I'm more, but if, you know, it's so small and if something hits you, it's like, man, like I have that old pickup truck and old, old ranger from the 80s in my garage and sometimes i would think man if i'm ever in an accident with that you know it feels kind of substantial but I, you know those things fold up so yeah it's the same thing with i'm i'd so for nine thousand for ten thousand dollars like I, I got my 2015 spark ev for nine thousand dollars with like nine thousand miles on this odometer that's it's i would much rather have that than a, than this brand new Zero mile. Yeah, your Spark is pretty cool. I got to drive it. Oh, I have that video coming. I think oh, next week oh, as well. Awesome. Um, yeah, and and the K twenty three, the other one, man. I don't. Do you have a profile view of that, Handy Martin? Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, if you just like look at the thing in, in profile, the, like the bottom still, it's like a good six inches. So it looks like the doors are like these kind of mini doors. Like I don't know how you'd even. You know, you have to kind of pry yourself in. Like you can see the picture there for you are watching us on YouTube. Is that it looks like at least six inches between the bottom of the car and then the bottom of the door? You know, it looks just looks. Yeah, it, that's ugly. And you gotta yeah, go for the base is, one. Oh my god, it's so ugly! I can't even. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, people were kind of ragging on, on the uh, the K twenty seven because it looked like the Daihatsu, but that's a strong point, you know. I mean, that's I, a good looking car. They, they should they should have copied something else for like the Honda Fit because it's kind of got those dimensions. I was yeah. just thinking the same thing. It's a very Honda Fit like, but hey, look, it's got a Cybertruck front hood. You see that little triangle in the in the front there where it meets? <laughs> it's got that little bulge there. So this is the cheap Cybertruck now. Yeah, man, it's got a face only a mother could love. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, geez. Anyway, sorry, sorry, Candy. You know, good luck to you. And uh, yeah, hey, I'm still pro on candy. I think I think they'll find their niche. I think they'll do well here. And again, it's it's all Geely Tech or Geely Tech for the most part. So we'll see. They also have a huge history of making super durable power sports products. So okay. um, maybe they carried through some of their their jet ski, their boat, their ATV, UTV like, tech into is that this candy stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's all of them. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we'll see if it's durable. Like Tom said, I will definitely have to test that. No question. I know people have been talking because Candy's been in a been a public company for a while. So back at like 2015 or so, I remember people like talking the stock up a little bit, you know, trying to, you know, rev up the brand. But, you know, what's just kind of either car back then was even was I forget the name of it. It's like a really super small and kind of kind of cute, but odd. But anyway, yeah. So that's Candy Technologies. And unless you had something to say about that, Martin? I've used shopping carts with bigger wheels than on <laughs> these two cars. Aren't they dinky? But, I mean, can you even get spare tyres for them? Skate or have I got to <laughs> fry them off my son's child's toy skateboard? But, uh, no, it's like for 10000 And then the difficult thing is, like the with the, the, the tax credit, of course, you know, it's a ten thousand dollar car after the tax credit right. money off next year's tax bill right. if you're eligible. So those people that are eligible have got more mo naturally have more money to spend. So why would somebody who is slightly more well off then buy a car like this, which is p purely uh, unless you're the other end of the scale? Unless ten grand for you is like a, you know, I'd, I'd spend it on a, you know, if you'd spend it on a boat this year or something, or like your leisure time and, and you've got a farm and you just want a a crazy quiet electric car that you're going to run into the ground. Um, it's, it's a, a bit of a dichotomy, but it's, it's fun. I mean, you know, run it for a couple of years, take the battery out, use it for home storage, crack on. Well, let's see how they go from here. Maybe they'll take their, what they learned from this exercise of launching these two cars and maybe come up with a, a more interesting, you know, future product, maybe something to match the market a little bit better. Well, I think it's definitely, like you mentioned, matching the market. It's the first time in the EV history in the US, for the most part, that we've seen a product launch for vehicles that are not optimized for our market at all. 
I yeah. mean, not, not in any way we do like Tom had mentioned, we do a ton of highway driving. We need, you know, big range because our efficiency is low cruising on the highway at 70, 80 miles an hour. These cars don't fit that bill and they're for any inner city use. And I mean, it's a very small subset of people that are going to buy this. I agree, but I still think, uh, we'll see some orders from this commuting, uh, ideology where if you really have this sort of back road under 70 mile an hour commute, you can save that gas money. I think that might be a sell. We'll see. Yeah, I wouldn't take and, and either also, of these on the interstate. It's just scary. It's just one of the things that anything happens, you know, there's but, also some state rebates like here in New Jersey, the K27, depending on how many miles of range it has, it might be eligible for another $2,000 of, of incentives. So now you're talking about a brand new car for $8,000. I, I probably still wouldn't buy it, but that's crazy. Now, I, I just spent $3,600 on a bicycle. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. two, two of my bikes, I could have bought a car. So I, yeah, this goes right. faster than your bicycle and it's safer. It's worth the yeah. extra money. And in the winter, you're going to be dry. That. So, you know, why not? I think if we, hey, if we get one of these, we should have a little race with Tom on his bicycle. And you in the K27, that would be awesome, man. <laughs> Drag race against Tom. It is an e-bike, so right. I, I might be able to beat you. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's or 3600 bucks. They better have something going on. <laughs> better motor-wise. pop a wheelie every time you hit that throttle. <laughs> right on. So shall we move along? All right. So uh, last week, uh, we told you that the Lucid Air should get about 517 miles of range. This week, we've learned a few more things about that luxury sedan. Uh, the big thing is that it will charge at over 300 kilowatts, so that it, it uh, one could add about 300 miles of range in 20 minutes, which is you know pretty remarkable. And uh, we also learned that it will beat a Raven Tesla Model S performance off the line and probably over the quarter mile. So when it debuts here shortly on the uh, 9th of September, uh, it will wear the crown for range charging speed and quickness that i think is how you launch a new car company in the us product comes first kyle how psyched up how psyched are you about the lucid air now now that we know these things right well i i you know they're doing everything right they've been really quiet up to this point they got the funding they needed they built a super solid product i believe in a prototype stage and now they're just sitting back you know of course peter hawk holding our head of productions getting that factory going in casa grande arizona um they're they're ticking all the right boxes here and just think about the specs here you have 500 plus mile range you have, what is it, some crazy, right, 300 miles of range in 20 minutes. It's a 300 kilowatt peak or so. We'll see how long it can sustain. But a 900, high 900 volt battery pack um, really means huge efficiency. It means that chargers are going to have to work less to get you the same amount of power. So hopefully they don't thermal throttle on their end. And uh, the car is definitely going to have to have a DC to the DC booster of some kind to charge on older you know, 50 kilowatt chargers that can only go up to 400 volts. The Taycan has the same problem. They have an onboard booster. Um, I'm super psyched about this. No question this car will hold the cannonball record here in the U.S., and uh, it is by far going to be the best way to travel. The big question is going to be charging station reliability. When you plug your $100,000 Lucid in, whatever it's going to cost, the way you spec it out, is Electrify America going to charge the Lucid on the first go? And the answer right now would be a question mark. However, um, we'll start to see hopefully some station reliability now that there's more partner manufacturers, more stress on them to push Electrify America to have a really good solid network because that's really the key. They have a great rollout. You have great charging. You have great long distance ability. Just need the chargers to work. So we should say we we kind of know a little bit more about these races that we can't say anything about, but there's been a lot of pushback on, on Twitter and even in our comment section, but the, the Tesla maybe wasn't the, the latest or greatest, but yeah, it definitely is like a brand new Raven model s performance and it, it's it gets beat which you know it's fine because tesla can come back and try to compete against that again you know it, it's it's fine it's like and it's i think it's going to be a slightly different te- uh price bracket than than 
the Tesla Model S too. I think it's going to be a bit more expensive, I guess, for that for the upper uh, for the large battery anyway. But yeah, I'm hoping they really push Tesla on on their interiors, their luxury interiors. Just move a little more. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but anyway, yeah, Tom, tell us tell us something. What do you what do you, what can you tell us about this? So we you know we got a lot of information about Lucid charging uh, this week. Not just the fact that. It does the peak, it has a peak charging rate of over 300 kilowatts and can replenish 300 miles in 20 minutes. Uh, you know, we also found out that it's going to be, the, the vehicle is going to launch with vehicle to grid capability. Uh -huh. And Lucid is making their own home charging solution, the, the, uh, their own um, home charger. There's a picture of it up on screen right now. And that can deliver 19.2 kilowatts to the car. So it's, 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 it's a, a very robust home charging. And the fact that it's vehicle to grid capable, that charger is vehicle to, to grid capable. So the combination of the car and if you buy Lucid's home charging solution, you'll be able to power your house with your car um, f through the AC. So, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be CCS capable also for a uh, vehicle to grid. However, there's really no uh, CCS stations that are capable of, of, of doing that yet. You know, that, that whole protocol still has to get all worked out. But, but the car will be able to power your home basically out of the box if you buy their, uh, their home charging solution. That's, that's great news. So if we do that, if we like pl plug our car into our house to power the house, do we have to s d turn off like the master switch to the grid first or something to prevent uh, yeah, islanding? I mean, that's, that, that, that's something that will definitely be a topic of discussion because you right. could potentially be um, uh, back feeding the grid. And if the grid is out and there's people service, uh, you know, trying to repair the wires or whatever. So, I mean, it would be basically like a generator. You'd have a transfer switch where you'll have to disconnect your home from the from from the grid to use it. But what Lucid also talked about was, and you know, and I don't know how big the use case is for this, but you know, they said, well, you know, it, it'll it it'll be fantastic for people that have like little cabins or something out in, in rural areas where they aren't connected to the grid that they could actually yeah. install the charger there and and then you know have power in the house when they go up and visit on the weekends. I yeah, was just looking at this at uh, the video here that's shown on the YouTube of the uh, Lucid prototype, just roasting tires, man. I never, I never thought of Lucid as like a performance brand. Like, you know, look at the, you look at the car, the styling. Actually, the styling doesn't really is doesn't really do do anything for me. But it, you know, but I'm thinking of of uh, Lucid as like a luxury brand. But after seeing that that beat down and like watching this little video that you were just playing, Martin, and this thing's got some. Uh, this is like a performance brand coming up here. I mean, it's luxury performance. Should should Mercedes be worried, Martin? Yeah, I think that they are. Yeah, right. So they are, uh, as we said at the beginning of this segment, that this is how to do a, a product launch. Uh, it is, you know, you don't have to be the best at everything, which is the frustrating <laughs> thing that I think I find sometimes with elements of certain communities where they want their favorite brands to be, you know, the best. I sort of want to send them back pictures of a of an electric backhoe and wait for them to reply, my Tesla digs my garden better than that does because <laughs> they're just so irrational, right? They're just so right. They can't get their head around the fact that there could be a, a car possibly better in, in one way than the one that they are signed up to defend at all costs. But yeah, you're right. Like the reaction we saw these, uh, the this one video that, uh, that went online, uh, that uh, the drag strip uh, video and just the reaction so frustrating because rather than wanting to see the EV community build like that rising tide floating all boats that I've talked about before on this podcast. Just that division that is coming. That I think this is a phenomenon over the last six, 12 months that I've seen more and more of just people just getting angry, being like, no way is that faster than a Tesla. And like, like the, the Tesla driver was sleeping and like, that's a 2012 car. None of which were true. They did like it, that that can't be the only run that they did, right? If they if someone's taken a video of it, there would have been lots of runs. Can't wait to see more uh, when we can find out more about this. But so what? So what if it goes quicker? Good on them because all it'll all it'll do is it'll make everyone get better. It'll make that maybe the plaid the plaid version of S and X will come quicker than we than we, than it was going to come. So it's 
it's positive. It's pos- every Everybody wins when things like this happen. So I saw that frustration. Well, I saw that and I was frustrated myself because along with the positivity came this huge amount of negativity of it can't possibly do that. Like I refuse to believe it. Well, I didn't, I didn't think of Lucid as a performance brand either to answer your question, but it's quick. And like, how much quick do you need? Well, if you've got it, you're not going to say no. Of course, this is luxury executive. This is not a price point that I'd be buying a car, for instance. But man, is it exciting. Have we seen interior pictures yet? Because I can't think what the inside looks like. I see Carl not in his head. Huh? We have. Not okay. a production version. That's what uh, okay. September 9th. Yeah, oh, so that's what we're waiting. So we'll see more on the 9th. And of course, on the 9th as well, we'll see... Uh, uh, the oh, what, what we're going to come on to in a minute, which is which is more from Tesla, uh, from Lucid. Uh, hey Tom, have you have you seen the interior though the, of the production interior yet that you can't talk about? Um, unfortunately, no. I was I was invited to go out to California next Thursday and uh-huh. have a preview and record videos, shoot pictures, and so forth and so on. So I'd be ready to go on the eighth. Mm. Um, but, you know, had some conversations with my wife and we decided that, you know, the 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 12 hour round trip, 12 hours on a plane to spend six hours in California mm. probably isn't the smartest thing to do right now uh, and yeah. uh, decided against it. So um, Lucid is going to provide me with that information. Um, I just won't be able to see it firsthand. Yeah, looking forward to seeing the interior. That's that's going to be a, a, a key. I mean. I just want. I just. I want it to be good, you know. So, not because I don't have. Yeah. Any, I don't have any doubt that it will be. Because <clears> I think the styling of it is so good. Like I, it's. <laughs> I'm gonna. You like I'm the exterior? Gonna, I love the exterior, and okay. I'm gonna. And I love the look of that that charger that we were flashing up. If you're watching the YouTube yeah. version of this a minute ago, it was unfussy, and I. You know, I hate to draw everything back to, to Tesla, but this is where a, a big cohort of the Lucid team came from. And, you know, back in the day when Tesla first arrived, we were all blown away and, and still are at, at their their aesthetic and their design aesthetic and everything that seems... It's like when, they, when the iPhone first arrived, it just seems so obvious. Like, well, this is how, this is how a car should be. Like, like the infotainment system inside uh, bits of it inside a Tesla. And I know that, you know, fans of the Polestar and the Android system more recently, but... That charge has looked so good. The styling is good. I hope I I have no doubt the interior is going to be good because I just think they're 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 switched on. They're just they've got it going on right now. I really can't wait to see more. And I think that uh, even the uh, the the styling of their other other cars is going to be bang on. Right. Well, so speaking of their other cars, um, that's not the only Lucid ve- vehicle in the news this week. They've Don't also like had that? their little segue, little segue right. there for you, Dom. You were not supposed to talk about the segue. <laughs> First rule about the secret segue. Okay, <laughs> Don't talk about. It. So that's not okay. That's not the only Lucid thing we've seen. We've also now just seen their SUV spotted out in the wild. A uh, number of pictures of the air and this SUV were were posted on Twitter. And I don't know. Do you have a shot of that we can share on with her? Vi- YouTube I do, audience? I do, I do. Yes, yes, I do. And then, uh, and again, this one was a little more controversial in terms of the styling of the SUV. Yeah. Yeah, we can kind of see that. Yeah, if you can dig up the tweet, we get a few more shots of it. But that get, basically gives you a good profile look. You know, it's got some big, ugly wheels. It looks like a pretty large vehicle, though, right? It's on the same platform, I understand, as the, the Lucid Air, as a sedan. But, it, it, you know, it looks pretty big. There's a guy standing beside it. It kind of reminds me of across the back. It reminds me of like the Rivian uh, SUV. It's got that single brake light, brake light all the way across the bar, and then on the side, it kind of it puts me in mind of the, like the uh, uh, Fisker Ocean a little, a little bit. You know, not not, not too much, but, but like on huge, huge wheels. And those wheels are, I don't know. I think they're ugly. But Kyle, you're a wheel expert. What do you think of that? Oh, I'm no wheel expert. You know, my opinion will never agree with yours. I love the wheels. Uh, So, you know, I I think the, yeah, actually, I like the SUV more than the air uh, in this particular case. I think the air looks really good until you get to the C pillar. And then that big clamshell trunk thing just doesn't do it for me. Uh, 
I, the only thing I can say that I don't particularly love about this SUV, first off, you can see that huge rake to the windshield. Uh, aesthetically, I like big boxy SUVs, you know, Range Rovers, things like this. But uh, I think for efficiency, that's why you see that much rake on that windshield. Uh, the second thing is uh, that that straight tail light across the back. Now, I know, again, I'm the outlier here. I actually have never seen a car that I've liked that's had a consistent beam across the rear. I know it's the trend we're going to. It just reminds me of Dodge Chargers, not super into it. But other than that, I, I think they nailed it with this. Uh, you know, I'd like to see them spec a little bit of a wider tire. I understand why it's not uh, as wide. You get a little bit better range if you have a little bit of a stretch on that sidewall, um, putting a narrower tire for the wheel, basically. It could just be a concept thing, of course. Concept, you know, car designers love big wheels, little tires. Right. Um, so we'll see if this is production ready or not. My guess is no. Um, but I, I, I think they're off. To, they're they're going to do very well with this vehicle. Um, it's it's what's needed, and you know, we're going to see great figures as well. They said it's going to be almost as efficient as the air. Uh, so we're expecting around five hundred miles of range out of this thing. That's insane. It's going to be really cool. I never really noticed that roof, those roof racks are kind of like, you know, like a permanent fixture. It looks like it has right. a glass roof too. I, had no I would guess you could get it with or without uh, just for efficiency, knowing Lucid every last quarter of a percent, you know, they'll lose sleep over. Uh, I think it looks really good with those roof rails, particularly. And right. the color combo is not yeah. bad. At first, I thought it was a brown, then it's green, and then you see it some other light. And you just, I, I think it's a cool color. And uh, looks perfect there in California, Tom. It is a panoramic glass roof, by the way. I've seen uh, the the, the right. shots from above. I'll try and bring one up, and uh, that is a glass roof all the way to that that rear roof rack. Okay. As well, by the look of cool. it, cool. Yeah, the whole thing is glass. By the look. Hey, of Tom, it. do you think you'd drive this over the over the sedan? Definitely. I really like the styling on hey. this guy here, and I love how you know Lucid took it took you know the uh, their vehicle their their car the air and made like interpreted that into mm. a, 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 a an SUV it really you can see it's got all lucid styling it really is um, uh, uh, I think I think it's a winner I think the roof rat rails probably also would be optional uh, you know and this could just be you know special stylistic roof rails for their concept you know and when the when the when the production vehicle comes, it, it might have a different way that they attach to the vehicle. They might not be permanent like those look. Those appear to be you know permanently attached to the vehicle. But um, now I think they hit it well. I think it's the right vehicle. You know we've said this before. That's what people at least here in the U.S. That is what people are buying SUVs, crossovers. Uh, you know so the, you know that that kind of and pickup trucks. So you know that that kind of had to be their next vehicle. Uh, I, I, I don't think that they would, I think the electric pickup truck, uh, you know, crowd is, is, is getting a little crowded now. So I, I would, I'm glad that they decided to go into the family moving SUV segment rather than a pickup truck. But like talking about pickup trucks, like Rivian, it seems Lucid is just kind of doing everything right, which is, it's, it's so encouraging to see that I'm echoing sentiments of, you know, Martin and, and, uh, um, and Kyle went, went talking about that, you know, they just seem to be hitting everything. Uh, you know, every time we hear news about them, it's better and better. Um, you know, it's kind of like the, you know, under promise, you know, over deliver. And we just keep getting, the news just keeps getting better. And uh, I'm so excited uh, about seeing uh, Lucid, both Lucid and Rivian uh, coming to market next year. I'm, 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 I, th I think this is going to be, really a, a, a great time for electric vehicles There's that new brands are coming that are delivering compelling ex vehicles that people are going to be excited about, not just like, oh, yeah, it's an electric car and it goes 300 miles. That's nice. I mean, we need those vehicles, too. But the fact that these new brands are coming out with really exciting car vehicles that are pushing the limits, that are doing things that existing electric vehicles can't do. Uh, I, th I think that's really the, 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 the story there. And uh, it's a good time for electric vehicles. I'm looking forward to 2021. And, and they're doing things that, like uh, the sorry, and, and they're doing things that, uh, you know, gas, gasoline powered vehicles can't do either. Like <laughs> the, the Dodge 
Dodge Ram, the, yeah, Ram, I guess call it. T Rex just debuted this week. It's like the the Raptor Fighter Dodge pickup truck, and it's like a what is it four seconds zero to sixty or something. It's like man, the the Rivian pickup truck is going to beat that. The, you know, next year, as far as like a pure acceleration, I guess the the Ram also has like 13 inches of travel, you know, so it's made for like going fast, like off road. And I don't know if you can, I don't know how the Rivian set up for that, but the Rivian can ford three feet of water. So there's that. But yeah, I, I just think that uh, the, the electric products coming are, are really just like spec wise, you know, I don't, I don't see why people would consider buying a fossil fuel car but then again i'm biased and whatever so yeah <laughs> but i do yeah. i do like well, the idea well of, to your point go ahead. i i think it's going to be really difficult uh for uh fossil fuel truck owners to get over the towing hurdle uh-huh. with electric vehicle pickup trucks i think that's just the big question for me even uh you know we have this this solar trailer, uh, this big trailer now that that we have with solar panels on the roof. I have a power wall coming to put inside of it, probably. Um, and I'm thinking about what we're going to get to tow with it. And I'd love to have an electric vehicle to tow, but this is probably a seven, eight thousand pound trailer. Uh, I'm just thinking about the the range on any electric vehicle that we tow with this thing is going to be minimal for ri- for road trips. So um, it's going to be something we're going to have to look into for this type of, of uh, use case for these pickup trucks. But like Tom says, a lot of people buy pickup trucks just to drive around, go to the shops. And that's where these are absolutely perfect. And they can still haul. Uh, they can tow. It's just uh, over a long distance is going to be tough. Right. Especially if there's like a, well, is that trailer you're talking about? Is that a camper trailer or is that like a, just a utility trailer? No, it's a car hauler. Oh, okay. So you might have to do some distance. So what, what's a good distance for you while towing? Like a uh, I, I'd really like to get 200 miles with a trailer on the back. I think okay. that's the, that for me is, is reasonable, you know, with an yeah. 80% charge, uh, when it starts to taper a 200 mile cruising range, I could easily live with even 150 probably. Okay. I, I think you can get that with the Rivian and the Cybertruck, right? We'll Rivian's see. Like we'll 400 see. miles, Cybertruck's 500. Yeah, but trailering more than doubles your consumption. I mean, the way this trailer is, and sometimes triples. On a Model 3, we did a towing test on the Inside EV's YouTube channel. You can go back. And I think we right. were with a little U-Haul trailer. We're getting seven, 800 watt hour per mile. Mm. Um, you know, a Model X 100D towing a camper trailer gets a 100 mile range. This is from uh, the Tesla family, the all-electric All right, right, right. family YouTube channel. They get uh, 1% is equal to one mile. And that's just a little camper. So, I mean, it just kills efficiency. Okay. Well, that's something to keep in mind. Yeah. But, right. There's still a huge market over there who people do, who don't tow over any distance who is still, I mean, I could see my own, my own pickup. I, I remember I towed a trailer full of kayaks one time. I think it's pretty much the extent of my t- towing ability. Yeah. Usually I use it for racks, like for ex- bed extender, whatever. Right. And we'll see trailers optimized for it as well. We've seen, uh, is it James Claffin? He has a battery pack that he hooked into his Model X, essentially doubling the battery capacity uh, from the trailer and the vehicle. We've seen trailers that can output power and regen on their own on the back of the car. So we'll see solutions to this. I'm just saying right now, this is a big question mark for me personally. Right. Yeah. Camping trailers, actually powered camping trailers. I think that's uh, going to be really super awesome i i, I gotta believe it's coming eventually right like so your your camper has all the power you need so you can plug in and live in it on, on the weekend you have and then when you're drive, you know when you're driving it power helps you get up the hills say just like in certain instances it could turn on motors in, in the trailer and you know help you up the hill so you, you keep a lot of range for your primary vehicle yeah, I think there's a French company that's doing it. We should talk about it at some point on the podcast. I need to learn more about it. But yeah, there's one on the market that does exactly that. Right. And I'm, I'm talking to a company today that just launched a product that is um, uh, solar panels for the back of pickup trucks. And it folds up. It's in four sections. So um, it actually um, be- secures the bed. It locks so, you know, nobody could get access to the bed. But as you need it, it folds up into four different sections. Um, they're bringing it to market really soon. I, I don't have all the technical details. I'm, I'm actually interviewing the CEO today, and I'm probably going to have an article up on Inside EVs this week. So for people interested in that, that might help uh, for long-distance traveling. I know it's not going to provide a ton of energy, but, hey, 
every little bit helps. If you're on these long drives and it's sunny out, Kyle, you know, you might, you know, it might give you an extra 20 or 30 miles, you know, over the course of a few hours of driving if you're in direct sunlight. So. Or, or if you're camped at a spot over the weekend, you know, you're, you're sitting there. Exactly. Yeah. And, and no, notable about th- this new solar power, this new solar panels for the back of the truck. It's not just for electric pickup trucks. It has a, right. a battery in it so that, you know, you, you, if you, even if you had a gas pickup truck, you might buy this and it charges the battery. So when you're at work sites, you can use that stored energy to power tools and things like that, or camping to uh, power, you know, whatever you need. Right. It'd be interesting to see what kind of plan they have to fit different size beds, like, like the bed of the Rivian, for instance, is the one that comes to mind, you know, it's because a little bit of different shape and size. Yeah. I should yeah, I plan on some big adventures into the middle of nowhere with these Rivians. Uh, I'd really like to do the Pan American Trail, for example, and uh, charging is going to be our main concern. So this is mm. this is super enticing, at least. You know, I'm of the mindset where we're going to have to travel at night and charge during the day, which will be kind of interesting. Hmm. Right on. Hey, so let's uh, move along. The Porsche Taycan has launched, or it just launched like a year ago, but the automaker has already made some changes, including more power. Uh, they say they shaved off two tenths of a second from zero to 200 kilometers an hour. That's 124.3 miles an hour. Uh, that's not really a metric that anyone uses, but they did give us an improved quarter mile time as well. They say it'll scoot uh, 1,320 feet, that's a quarter mile, uh, in 10.7 seconds now instead of 10.8. Of course, we've already seen the Taycan dip down into the 10.5 second range. So the numbers that Porsche is giving us are, are understated. Uh, they have some other changes as well, besides a little bit more power. They have a plug and charge function. Uh, basically uh, insert the cable and the Tycon establishes encrypted communication with the plug and charge compatible charging station. And, you know, you just get it. The charging starts automatically. The billing starts automatically. It's just seamless like a Tesla, basically supercharger situation. So that's great. Um, different vehicle functions can also be flexibly ordered online. So they call this functions on demand or FOD. Uh, the Porsche Intelligent Range Manager uh, is already available as an FOD. Uh, Power Steering Plus, Active Lane Keep Assist, and Porsche Inno Drive, it, which I'm not sure what that is, uh, will also be added as further FOD functions. Um, they've also got, as an option, you can get a, the heads up display in color. And there's now an optional 20, 22 kilowatt AC onboard charger. And in the future, in the future, there is an adaptive air suspension that will feature a smart lift function. So that it will raise and lower at certain places, like coming into your driveway. You can, you know, ge- geospatially link to that spot, and it'll raise up. So you, you have a crazy driveway like I have. You can go up without scraping anything. Or on the highway, I think it'll it'll judge uh, your range and maybe lower yourself on the highway automatically when you're driving. Uh, so, Tom, are you surprised by the, the infor- performance increase, or, or are you more impressed by these new rent-a-feature options? Well, definitely not surprised. Porsche always does this to their vehicles. They're always constantly tweaking them, um, taking feedback from customers, and and um, you know, adding new options to their vehicles. It, it's it really, you know, I don't think this has much to do with the fact that this is an electric Porsche. This is just Porsche, and this is just how they how they function. They're always making tweaks uh, to their vehicles. Uh, you know, I'm, I've made it clear my position on the Taycan. I absolutely loved it. I've driven Taycans quite a few occasions. I had the opportunity to drive one out in, uh, in Denmark and Germany on the Autobahn and I uh, was able to drive mine up to, you know, 167 miles an hour, I think it was. And I just love the car. I love the Taycan. If, you know, if, if money, if, if, if cost was just taken out of the picture and you could say you can have one EV, uh, I, I would replace my Model 3 with, with, with a Taycan. I absolutely love the vehicle. Love what Porsche did with it. And, uh, you know, it's great to see them making it a little bit better uh, than what they came out with. And they came out of the box with, as far as I'm concerned, a fantastic electric car. So good on Porsche to, to keep uh, tweaking it, making it uh, a little better. Right on. So, um, Kyle, you have any thoughts about this rent a, rent a feature or the performance increase? 
Yeah, well, the Tycon really needed the extra power. You know, it was just so slow before. <laughs> you know, I, I, no, I think it, it, it's it's plenty fast. It's great news. What really boggles my mind is this Renta feature. They're almost the first ones. Actually, they might be the first ones to market with this type of feature. And we had a little discussion yesterday, Martin and, and everyone in, the, in our little chat. Uh, this is huge news for vehicle ownership. It's something that we're hoping maybe Tesla will go to one day with renting full self-driving features, whatever that means. Uh, you know, just the fact that you can purchase over the air functionality from your vehicle like you have with only one brand up to this point, and it affects not just uh, autonomous driving systems or ADAS, which InnoDrive is just Porsche's ADAS system. Um, oh, right. It's, it's uh, you know, power steering plus. It's all the things that are in there. They're just letting you unlock. So I, I think it's huge. I think it changes what uh, Volkswagen Group's direction is going to look like. We've actually already seen this with e-tron, I'm forgetting. In e-tron, you can purchase cornering lights on your uh, e-tron to be enabled in certain markets. Uh, right. So this is, yeah, so this is a good thing. I like that you can get into a car at a lower price point, say, ah, oh, you know, I wish I ticked that option. And you just go into the screen in the car and buy it. Uh, that's the big news here. The other news is really great. Of course, we know Porsche understates their numbers. Like Tom says, they do for every one of their products. It's always worst case scenario from their internal combustion cars. The way we always refer to it is you'll achieve Porsche's quoted figure at the highest altitude on the hottest day with the poorest fuel quality. And it's the same for their EVs as well. So it's uh, Porsche is my favorite legacy automaker. I have owned them. I love them. I will always continue to love Porsche and uh, a Taycan's definitely in my future. However, it will have to be used and heavily depreciated. Right. Well, while, well, while we're talking about oh, oh, the new being able to rent the features, I had always thought it would be an awesome thing if Tesla allowed you to uh, say, have the uh, like I have a Model Three. I didn't get a Model Three Performance, but I can get the uh, the Performance upgrade for two thousand dollars. But I'm, it's just not worth it to me to spend two thousand dollars on it. But I thought it would be really cool if Tesla would have a service that would allow me to have that uh, extra power for like twenty four hours, like just for a day. I can go out. Let's say you know I'd be willing to pay a hundred bucks or one hundred and fifty dollars for the day to have the extra power. And uh, like whenever you want, you would you'd go into your website, your, your, you know, your My Tesla account and say, okay, start this at eight o'clock tomorrow and let it run to, till eight o'clock, uh, you know, Sunday morning. And then I have a whole day of having that extra power boost and then it goes away. Right. Uh, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure Tesla could do that. Uh, I think that would be a great revenue generator for them because I'm sure a lot of people would temporarily use things like that, maybe even you know full self driving, just to just to see how it works out, or maybe they're going on a long trip, they don't want to buy the whole thing, but they'd pay you know a, a couple hundred bucks to use it for a week or something like that. That might be uh, a, a cool thing for Tesla to do. I know customers would love it. I don't know if it makes financial sense to them as opposed to trying to get people on the hook to buy the whole thing, but um, I could see myself frequently paying say a hundred bucks for the day to have the performance upgrade for 24 hours. Um, along, you know, along, have, along with that, that, along with that track mode. Yeah. Yeah. hundred bucks. Okay. I yeah, I, I would say track mode's worth more. And you've seen uh, now this uh, electrified garage has this solution that is half the cost of Tesla's uh, boost upgrade plugs into your car. We just put it on my friend Joe Tripp's Model 3. We're testing it out and uh, instantly works fine. It's just a line of code and uh, no issues so far. We'll see if Tesla ever finds out or does anything about it, but that seems to be so far working great and the car is performing the same as the acceleration boost would be. Oh, we'll have to get that on, on the one lap. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's the same. It's just a Model 3 dual motor with Performance boost, it's just a, right. basically a cheaper way of doing it by just changing the code rather than paying Tesla to change the code. You just right. do it on your end for cheaper. Uh, I, and I love that idea. I, you know, I'm a big fan of you buy the car. You can do whatever you want to do with your car as long as you own it. And sure, you don't have to, you know, they can void your warranty or whatever. That, that doesn't necessarily bother me. Uh, so the fact that people are tuning and modifying Teslas now with these uh, electrified garage solutions, 
I'm all about it. I think it's great. If you have the, the capability in your car and you own that vehicle, go ahead, modify it, tune it. And hey, if Tesla blocks you from charging, that's a risk. Right on. Hey, so, um, so while we're still talking about the Porsche Taycan, I guess, ostensibly, um, there's an outfit called Prior Design that just released a body kit that kind of butches up the look a little bit. Uh, Martin, do you have a pick of that handy? It's like a, just like a wide body kit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you, what do you think of that, Martin? Would you, would you, uh, would this look good on a, on a British London street? <laughs> of course it would. Yeah, it looks fantastic. And I love that they're doing, uh, that the EVs are now, uh, at that stage where if you've got the money to do it, you can have a little play and make your car look different. Right. Uh, of course, any, anyone can do this to any car. You can wrap your, you know, wrap your car, whatever custom color or crazy, outfit camouflage whatever you want to put on your car but to actually add skirts and uh, spoilers and that big wing uh, a huge wing and uh i don't know if we've got a shot around the back and there's probably uh, uh some some stuff around the back as well but yeah just fan fantastic just uh, i'm just pleased that evs are in that stage now because it just implies a, uh, a maturity of the ev market which is what we've wanted to get to for a long time now as as carl just said you know uh, let's let's take these great cars and let's go have fun with them now rather than just being grateful that we've actually got the cars but that's a good thing we know we're maturing now into those areas of modding and tuning and stuff like that so totally excited about uh, something that looks that looks like that yes right, please right more of the same yes all right i won't spend any time on that but uh so yeah we've just got a few minutes left but i want to hit on this uh neo introduced the uh, battery as a service option uh apparently adds some flexibility and reduces uncertainty. Tom, can you tell us a bit about that real quick? Yeah, so we all know Renault did this with the Zoe for I think four or five years before they decided that they were just gonna sell the car with the battery. And you know, they initially did it, uh, from what I understand, to, to, to try to get people into EV, EVs more affordably because batteries were, were super expensive, the most expensive part of the car. Neo's different because they already have this ecosystem built out in China of this, their battery swap system. So they're really looking at um, the battery holistically different than most other electric vehicle companies do. Um, they, they really are taking more of the burden, Neo, uh, and taking that off of the customer with their battery swap, with unlimited battery swap. So you can basically... Um, never have to worry about your battery's capacity loss. If you buy a Neo, um, th th they just remove that that from 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 the, the 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 equation. You'll never have to worry that your car won't go as far, you know, four or five years down the road as it did when it was new. And and that's super important getting people into electric vehicles in China. In part, um, uh, another reason is that the fact that m most Chinese residents don't have control of their home electricity like we do in the U.S. and many people in Europe um, because they live in these giant apartment complexes. Now, very wealthy people do have private homes, but there's not a lot of them. Most people live in these large apartment complexes, don't have the ability to charge. So the battery swap really removes that worry from them. They know they can just run out in six or seven minutes, get the battery swap. Now the battery as a service takes it to one further level where you know you rent the battery separately from the car the car costs about ten thousand dollars less now so a fifty two thousand dollar es6 if you use battery as a service costs forty two thousand dollars so right now you take ten thousand dollars off the top of the cost of the car and you rent the battery for a hundred and forty dollars per month right and that's the price right now talk to neo about this and they said there's a good possibility that that price actually will go down in the future as their costs of the battery reduce, as battery prices go down, they're, they're fully open to reducing that cost to pass that along to the customer. Now, Neo partnered with CATL, their battery supplier, and formed an independent company. So you actually lease the battery from that company. And that company has all second and third life uses for the battery packs and cells all in the planning now. So as they retire batteries, as let's say 
you know, the, these because uh, these batteries are still going to get battery swapped. The, 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 the batteries get checked when they do the battery swaps. If, if there are cells that aren't working or if the battery capacity drops, the pack gets taken out of service. And this new third party company is going to be using it for load balancing. They're even going to be repurposing the battery cells for use in like electric scooters and bicycles. So it's good to have a battery company involved here that it's not just an automotive brand saying, geez, now what do we do with all these, these battery cells? We can do home energy storage. We can do like all the companies are talking about doing. Um, but now you've got a battery supplier involved who, who absolutely has things that they can do with that, with, with those battery cells. So, I mean, I love this whole ecosystem. Uh, and, and besides, there's one other thing that, that Neo told me. You know, when Leo first came to the market, they had a 70 kilowatt hour battery pack. Then they had an 84 kilowatt hour battery pack. Now they're going to be offering a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack. They see in the near future a larger pack available fitting in that same battery tray. So let's say you lease uh, uh, an ES6 today with a 70 kilowatt hour battery pack and you use battery as a service and you're paying your $140 per month. Um, and then you decide, you know what, I, I'd like to have more range. You can then say, okay, take the 70 kilowatt hour battery pack and give me your 100 kilowatt hour battery pack. You'll pay a little bit more per month instead of 140, I don't know, it might be 150, 160 a month. It won't be too much more, but it'll be more. Uh, and then two or three years from now, let's say they come out with a 130 kilowatt hour battery pack. Um, you can get that if you want. You could say, ah, take this 100 kilowatt hour battery pack. I don't want it. I want that new one that even goes even further. They'll let you simply just get out of that lease and begin uh, leasing the new battery pack, and it might not even cost any more. So, you know, yeah. they're really, Neo's thinking outside of the box. They're doing some great things in China. I'm really bullish on that company. I know they had a, 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 a slow start, uh, but they seem to have the ground under them now, and they're just, they're, they're hitting on all cylinders, and I really like this. Um, particularly for the Chinese market. I don't know if it would work as well in, in other countries, um, particularly because it, it works really well with battery swap. And right. Neo already has 143 battery swap stations. Um, and uh, they also have DC fast chargers. So you don't have to swap your battery. They're building out a network of high-speed uh, charging stations. So if, if you have the time or you're not near a battery swap station, you can charge the car on, on Neo's DC fast charger or a, 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 a third party uh, network. But, uh, you know, this battery as a service, I think it works and I think it's going to be successful for them. I think they're going to sell a lot more cars in 2021 because of it. Well, that makes a lot, a lot more sense because for me, uh, like Renault, you were saying that, that you can rent the Renault battery separate from the car. And I could never wrap my head around why you would want to do that because, it, it, you know, you have to pay for the battery. The battery has to be paid for by somebody and, and the car company is not going to take a loss on, on that. So it's like getting two bills for your one thing. But with a removable pack, like you were saying, it makes a lot more sense, especially with the battery company involved and in, in the second life usage. I just did some quick math here, and it's like it's that $140 a month. That's like six years, basically, of $140 a month to pay off that that pack for the for the car. But if you were like the owner of the car and you were taking that option, you know, you, you, you it would just gives you a lot of flexibility and it gives you a, like another option. And, and yeah. I, and just think about it, Tom. You never have to worry about battery battery pack degradation ever. Right. As long That's, as you own the car. If anything, you'll be able to go further in a couple of years because you'll you'll just say, "Hey, take this battery pack. I want that new one that goes fifty miles further." So right. um, I, think, I think it's a good idea. Well, you guys, you guys know that my Zoe is battery leased, right? So yeah, right, I'm in, right. So I'm, I'm in that boat. So um, it took eight thousand so pounds off the price of a new car for me. So uh, that's, that's, that's why I did it for instance, um, right. because so, uh, you know, it, re it reduced my, my entry point of driving that car. So, but now you have two bills. So how long will it take like to make up the difference? Of well, paying, no, it's a, like it's a, oh, well, I mean, longer than I would own the car for. So I pay 50 pounds okay. uh, a month for the battery. So, over a year, what's that? That's 600 times by 12. And so I got 8,000 pounds. I could have bought a Renault Zoe with the battery owned, 
right. but we didn't have we didn't have enough money. Now, right. if you're doing it on finance, then and you're paying monthly for the car, then you might want to do that. But we we were buying the car, um, and it's something that I didn't get my head around until I did it. But I own the car. I own all of the car apart from the battery, and uh, I have a specialist EV insurance, as many people do. So when I called my insurance company, who specialise in EVs, and I told them I had a Zoe, and they said, "Right, okay, is it battery lease, battery owned?" And so it's battery lease. So I have to I have to insure the battery in case the car is written off, because um, Renault will want their money. But that's fine. But they they were prepared for that. It's a tick box on the screen. So the car is insured, the battery is insured. I do both of those. The lease is is fifty pounds a month that I pay to a separate same as this it's a separate company and uh, uh, and it's regular income for them for Renault or a division of Renault and you know for me it, it took eight thousand pounds off the price of the car also the only expensive bit of the car that can go wrong is the battery and it's not my problem and also it comes with free recovery so Renault do a service where if you do battery lease uh, the, and, you, and you run out of if you run out of electricity through just stupidity because you forgot to charge it, they'll come and pick you up and take you home. So uh, that, for me, uh, made total sense. But I still tell friends about it, and they they can't get their head around it. But I wonder if this is is a, is a that's a microcosm of where the of of where we're going with cars. Like do like how much of my car do I own? Well, all of it apart from the battery. Now you can do the battery buyout. So I could I can contact Renault now for a price, and they'll look at my mileage. Uh, and probably the battery health. Maybe I've got the little uh, dongle that I it goes in the by the cigarette lighter, and it's ninety nine percent battery state of health, so it's still in good nick. It's a year old, and I can do a battery buyout if I wanted to, but it makes no sense because I'd be like, what do I get for it? I'm only fifty pounds a month down on it anyway. But yeah, you know, like I say, it's like it's the larger, it's the larger thing about how we view cars. Like we all grew up owning cars that didn't change the day after they left the factory. And now we have situations like where we see Rich Rebuilds, the YouTube channel where he takes, he used to, doesn't anymore, but take a scrap Tesla, put it back on the road, and yet Tesla were then able to go, well, hang on, we're turning off DC fast charging for that car because you might not have repaired it right. And, you know, the internet was up in arms because they're like, well, hang on, it's not Tesla's car to turn off DC fast charging. What? So it opens that question of, well, who owns the car? And so if we're moving to a model of, you don't really own the car. Like you, maybe you buy it or lease it or finance it, but the car is the car is outside your house. But I mean, how much of it do you really own? If a, if a company can dial in over the air and turn features on off, stop it even moving, for instance, do you own that car? How much do they still control that car? And so I think that it'll take a while for people to get their head around, and it might not happen outside of China. But the battery lease, the battery swap thing is. Uh, it is is a brilliant idea because it reduces your entry point to get that car and it, it changes right. your relationship with the car um and i know that's a different i'm i'm sitting here it's a different cultural thing in the us i know that you know getting your driving license and learning to drive is a rite of passage in the us and 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 driving operates in a in a different kind of part of your you know your your country's culture as well like the idea that you wouldn't own all of your car seems a bit crazy. So yeah. it's going to be really interesting where this goes. Okay, Kyle, any further thoughts on that? Uh, well, I, you know, I, I'm curious to see how this renting battery thing actually plays out. Because, you know, if you look at the 2013 Smarts, they had some battery assurance plus plan. I don't think it was a battery rental, but it was like a Something to do with extended warranty. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I know I bought one second hand or third hand at that point, you know, as I was the third owner and uh, it never got transferred into my name and I didn't want it transferred in my name. So I never really brought it up, but I don't know what happened with that. I think someone's still spending $80 a month on that battery, but I wanted nothing to do with that. Right. So, uh, you know, who knows, but you know, I, I would think the, the whole, uh, uh, accident situation, uh, selling transactional trading into a dealer, but not putting the contract in the dealer's name. Who's going to, you know, withhold that, that contract. These are all questions that I, I think someone will figure out, um, for the U S market. But that's, that's my biggest thing. If you go to a used car dealer, trade in your, your Neo or any car with a rented battery. And you're like, by the way, now that I sold it to you, you have to spend $80 right. a month. 
to pay for that battery. They're not going to do that. They're just going to sell it off. And, and you know, the first owner is going to be stuck with that contract. Yeah, it should be interesting. So and I wonder people, what's People were happen. asking about Neo actually coming to the States. Uh, I think in the comments of that article you had, there, Tom, and I believe you said maybe in a couple of years, they'll be in Europe. And shortly after that, hopefully the US, I know they have international ambitions. Yeah, their CEO just uh, did a live stream yesterday. And he made comments that, you know, their eyes are looking towards the West now. So, um, you know, it's it, the writings on the wall. They, they do have plans. Um, and, and that's something that's that'll be really interesting be, because the fact that it seems like the, their business model is based around battery swap. And now battery as a service and they don't have that infrastructure in the U.S. or Europe, you know, so, uh, you know, that's going to be interesting. Uh, I always said that I loved what Neo was doing with battery swap in China. Uh, right. And you know, I didn't know how well that would translate to other areas of the world. And I still don't know how well that would translate into the U.S. and Europe. But um, I know it works there. I've done it. I've driven Neo's cars in China. I've used their battery swap. I've talked to their customers. Nearly everyone I spoke to, the Neo, uh, the Neo customers said they probably wouldn't have gotten the car if it didn't offer the battery swap. So it works there and it's selling Neos. It'll be interesting to see what happens if and when Neo comes west and how they deal with battery swap in these different markets. Right on. Well, uh, we just want to hit a couple of things really quick. We're over our time, but I just want to mention some headlines here. Uh, Genesis of the Hyundai Group is. Uh, testing some electric versions of their gasoline powered models. So that, that'd be interesting to see, keep an eye on it because they did such a great job of like the, uh, the Hyundai um, Kona electric and the, in the Nero electric Nero, you know, taking a gas car and turn it into an electric car. And so they might be able to do that same magic with a, uh, with her more, what do you call that? More performance luxury premium kind of brand Genesis. So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, also, if you're looking uh, for improvements in your full self-driving in your Tesla, uh, Elon Musk says th they're doing a full rewrite of that software. And when it's done, the improvements will be like a quantum leap. And so that's definitely something to keep an eye out for. And also Panasonic has a, is going to invest $100, $100 million in Tesla uh, in the Gigafactory, I believe. And that will increase their output by about... Uh, Ten percent, I believe. So that's. I'm not sure if that's going to be enough increase. That's kind of got me. We'll, we'll learn more about uh, Tesla's battery strategy. Strategy come uh, battery day, which I believe is the 22nd of September. If I'm wrong, someone can correct me. That's correct. all right. Awesome. So that brings us to the end of our show. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Um, if you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post or the YouTube comics comment section below, or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. Uh, don't forget, you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Tom is at Tomalog. Martin is at EV News Daily. Kyle is at Out of Spec. And I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Clack, er, clack. <laughs> Clip, Click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all next week. Ciao.